Understanding the beginnings of the terrain of revolutionary theory gives us extremely valuable historical insights around what we view as revolutionary theory today, around the emergence of materialism and Marxism as a whole. As the vein of theory and philosophy goes, in all fields, the beginnings of Marxism didn't purely start with the emergence of Karl Marx as an influential revolutionary thinker. He may have fundamentally solidified revolutionary theory, but he was not the actual beginning of revolution in the abstract realm of political theory. Marx carried heavy germinal insights from the Enlightenment period, germinal insights that would be synthesized into a more material approach to the field of revolutionary theory, a rupture from the grounds of philosophical idealism of the past. But what were these historical insights that Marx used, and where did they come from? There were emergent breaks in the traditional political theory of Hobbes, Grotius, and many political thinkers of the past that didn't permit a break from a governing apparatus. This potential, I say potential explicitly, break arguably started with John Locke's Second Treaty of Government, one that discussed the theoretical parameters of when revolt was perhaps morally permitted. But a true revolutionary theory wouldn't actually come to fruition until Rousseau, a revolutionary theory that would inspire and lay the groundwork for the French Revolution. Before we get started, this video is the very first in an entire series that will examine revolutionary theory and its changes throughout time. We will touch on Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, and even contemporary revolutionary theory that is emerging today under the name of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. While none of these future videos will necessarily be dependent on one another, or must be watched in sequence, this video seeks to lay down the fundamental beginnings of revolutionary theory and the emergence of a theory of revolution. For this, our main focus will be on Rousseau and much of his work in the social contract. It's incredibly important to point out, I think this is hands down the most important video we have done so far, and it's not even remotely close. This is also one of the more different videos I have done. We are going far beyond a text and pure explanation here. This video touches on and adds extreme clarity to things that will undoubtedly change the trajectory for many on the end looked at political theory, philosophy, and its application today. For that, I am beyond excited to bring this to you all. So without further ado, let's get started. So one question may arise. If this video is primarily surrounding Rousseau and Enlightenment thought, what's with the constant references to Marx and Marxism? Here's the answer. If we are to analyze revolutionary theory, it helps to have some relation to theory that might be more commonly known and relevant today. As pretty much the totality of revolutionary theory today, and I put extra emphasis on theory, has its roots in Marxism. Not only this, it's arguable that much of the theoretical inception of Marxism, ideas around socialism, critiques of property, starts with Rousseau. We see the very germinal insights that start to critique private property as we know it. A zero-sum game that purposely excludes the rest of the community in favor of an unequal system. Rousseau quotes here in Book 1, How could a man or a people seize a vast territory and keep out the rest of the human race except by a criminal usurpation? Since the action would rob the rest of mankind of the shelter and the food that nature has given them all in common. When Nunez Balbo stood on the shore and took possession of the southern seas and of South America in the name of the crown of Castile, was that enough to dispossess all the inhabitants and to exclude all the other princes of the world? If so, such idle ceremonies would have no end, and the Catholic king might without leaving his royal chamber have taken possessions of the whole universe, only accepting afterwards those parts of his empire already belonging to other princes. The exclusion of the common man and labor cultivating this land was first partially realized by John Locke, but then later theorized concretely with Rousseau. And undeniably, the next step from here in revolutionary theory is in fact Marxism and based in materialism. Thus, if we are examining Rousseau through the lens of revolution, being able to retroactively examine him from a Marxist orientation helps a ton. So, to start out, Rousseau starts the basis of his political theory from the social contract, an idea that dominates political theory and discourse since Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes and the Western world being the father of the social contract. To understand this, we have to delve a bit into classic political theory here. The idea of the social contract has evolved throughout time, but the rough elementary Hobbesian idea goes like this. 
Nature is cold and brutal. Humans are barbarous, and in order to survive, people must band together and place certain social and political limitations and obligations on ourselves as to ensure our mutual survival. In a contemporary sense today, rough examples may be the following. Since you have to use public roads in order to partake in society, you are forced to pay taxes. If someone murders your spouse, well, you don't simply go seek revenge and murder them back. You go through the legal process, etc. These are contemporary examples, and monarchy doesn't exactly apply today, but back when Hobbes wrote the Leviathan, the idea was that people subject themselves to the rule of a monarch, an absolute ruler, as to protect themselves from the cold harshness of uncivilized nature, a brutality that was far worse than any authoritarian monarchy in Hobbes' eyes. After Hobbes wrote the Leviathan in the mid-1600s, discourse around this central political ideal dominated. Thus, Rousseau comes along and rips much of our prior ideas of the social contract apart, mind you, while not completely abandoning contractual social relations. Rousseau takes aim with this via an enlightenment lens. We must understand that through Hobbes, Mother Nature may have been our mother, but she is a horrid evil woman who will cast you down with ease at any moment. To Hobbes, uncivilized nature was ultimate slavery, but this wasn't completely so with Rousseau. The famous line at the beginning of the social contract that has been echoed through history, man was born free and he is everywhere in chains. Again, the state of nature proposed by Locke was at odds with Hobbes as well, but after Rousseau we find a tangible prescriptive theory, and an idea that got Rousseau in major trouble in his day, having to flee his country and struggling to find safe places to live in Europe. Rousseau dissects this dilemma, an idea of legitimate rule of the strongest, with this. Let us grant, for a moment, that this so-called right exists. I suggest it can only produce a tissue of bewildering nonsense. For once might is made to be right, cause and effect are reversed, and every force which overcomes another force inherits the right which belonged to the vanquished. As soon as man can disobey with impunity, his disobedience becomes legitimate. And as the strongest is always right, the only problem is how to become the strongest. But what can be the validity of a right which perishes with the force on which it rests? If force compels obedience, there is no need to invoke a duty to obey. And if force ceases to compel obedience, there is no longer any obligation. Thus, the word right adds nothing to what is said by force. It is meaningless. Rousseau claims the right of the strongest argument is void of any necessary essence. It means practically nothing if you can just chop off their heads. Kind of what the French did after Rousseau. But Rousseau still sees the theory of the social contract necessary in many ways, but a contract made specifically and more importantly with your fellow citizens rather than with mere rulers. Again, Hobbes explicitly states that the social contract was a contract with monarchs as well, a contract that allowed and necessitated absolute rule. Often, the prior theoretical rationalization for this was that the absolute right to rule lies with the right of the strongest. The goal to bring civil tranquility between people to protect your property, yourself, and your family. But again, Rousseau sees glaring issues with this, he points this out here. It will be said that a despot gives his subjects the assurance of civil tranquility. Very well, but what does it profit them? If those wars against other powers which result from a despot's ambition, if his insatiable greed and the oppressive demands of his administration cause more desolation than civil strife would cause, what do people gain if their very condition of civil tranquility is one of their hardships? There is peace in dungeons, but is that enough to make dungeons desirable? The Greeks lived in peace in the cave of Cyclops awaiting their turn to be devoured. Why concern yourself with an absolute power when in many regards that very absolute power doesn't concern themselves with you? This is further illustrated when Rousseau goes into detail about war. To Rousseau, war isn't a relation or battle between men. It's a battle between states and rulers. The opposing soldiers aren't your enemy. If anything, your ruler or the opposing ruler that put you there is, as they are the ones jeopardizing your life, and more often than not, not for your benefit, and more accurately, merely at your expense. These pages in the social contract ushered in the French Revolution, 
the American Revolution, and further European revolts in the 1800s. Now, this is when our analysis of revolutionary theory gets really interesting. Despite the emergence of Marxism, the vein of the Enlightenment is arguably the most prescient force in today's activism. I will repeat that again. Today's radical activism is still within the vein of the Enlightenment and idealism. Despite Marx theoretically rupturing pure idealism in favor of a theory of materialism, I would argue that in the Western world, Marxism, materialism as we know it, has only remained in theory. This is where much of the significance of this video lies, but requires a tiny explanation on idealism and materialism. For the people who are not completely familiar on these terms, idealism is the central theory that ideas, consciousness, shape our material reality. That reality is indiscernible from our perception of reality itself. This is the leading metaphysical idea in the Enlightenment, and among thinkers like Rousseau and Locke. When Marx comes along, he explodes this idea with an almost, I say almost directly, opposite idea that material and matter shapes our direct consciousness, that our ideas and perception come from the material conditions we are subjected to. This is materialism and the metaphysical backdrop in which Marxism operates, a backdrop that has changed analysis far beyond Marxism though as well. Marxism in the West hasn't really existed yet in reality. Most of my videos are purely explanatory and I rarely make this type of commentary, but this is incredibly important. I also do not wish to hide this whatsoever. The American right remains one of the most philosophically ignorant and politically uneducated populations in the world, and in many ways, reasons that are not even remotely close to their fault. But the conditions that make this so are for another video. What is extremely significant is pointing out that even many on what we view as the far left is not even close to Marxism. It's liberalism. It's primarily in the vein of idealism, no matter how radical it seems. I'm not focusing on whether this is purely a good or a bad thing per se, but that Marxism has yet to fundamentally exist in any tangible reality in the West. Even in ideology, the argumentation for abortion rights can be and pretty much is centered in Locke's theory of property your body being the first property that you possess. Our anti-war protest that we have seen in Vietnam to Iraq, the arguments used against American military intervention are clearly centered in liberal ideas seen in Rousseau's The Social Contract on chapter four. The passage we just covered in this video, where rulers use you as a pawn for their own benefit, but claim it is for your quote unquote safety and your freedom. My body, my choice, ideas around consent, Ideas around gender and racial equality are all things almost always argued in the vein of idealism and liberalism. Many Marxists who actually reasonably agree with these enlightenment ideals laughably scoff at the idea that they're coming from an actual idealist perspective. But this is what is extremely important about retroactive examination. It forces you to shed that very aesthetic ideology. That, in a very Hegelian sense, in which Marx existed, understanding materialism actually warrants an understanding of idealism. Yet, this isn't to say that materialism or Marxism is antithetical to any of these ideas. It's actually arguable that materialism does more to address these very issues, but rather, materialism and idealism are just different theoretical frameworks that have been employed. This is where we run into Marx. Rousseau and many Enlightenment thinkers were the hidden kernels of Marx's thought. Germinal ideas around the proletariat show up in Rousseau's political theory. Abstract class starts to emerge. The idea that the social contract is truly warrantable primarily among fellow citizens, where the current authority opposing ruling classes, monarchies as we historically know it, make that contract null and void. Rousseau's famous lines, such as, man was born free, but everywhere he is in chains, echo the very Marxist sentiments of, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Marx was not an Enlightenment liberal, but understanding the late ruptures of the Enlightenment, the very ruptures that necessitated a more material analysis, is incredibly useful when understanding Marx. This is why movement and an understanding of history is necessary. Anything less than a dialectical approach to Marx utterly fails in my opinion. There are forms of enlightenment continuity with Marx, and to understand materialism, this is 100% necessary to understand. 
understanding Marxism and more contemporary revolution require the insights on the enlightenment and the philosophical history of idealism. Understanding the beginnings of revolution is understanding revolution through the framework of idealism and further understanding how the enlightenment played a massive role in the contemporary shift on revolutionary theory that we see today, primarily through materialism and Marxism later on. This is where our next video on revolutionary theory will follow, through the emergence of Marx, and here is where things will get extremely interesting. We will take an extremely dialectical approach to this as well and make references back to the Enlightenment and Enlightenment thinkers. The mere activism that we see today, the mere quote-unquote revolution that we see today is not radical at all, really. It's in the vein of idealism and Enlightenment thought that has been around for hundreds of years. When we get into Marxism, into materialism, is when we actually see radical thought emerge. Radical thought that hasn't really been employed in activism in the West whatsoever, even among people who identify as Marxists. For that, this is when things will get interesting, and for that, this is where we see the plane of theory change forever. With that said, I will leave this off with the final words on Rousseau words that further echo his political theory, a political theory in the vein of incoming revolution. To renounce freedom is to renounce one's humanity, one's rights as a man, and equally one's duties. There is no possible quid pro quo for one who renounces everything. Indeed, such renunciation is contrary to man's very nature. For if you take away stipulated absolute dominion for one party, an absolute obedience for the other would be illogical and nugatory. It is not evident that he who is entitled to demand everything owes nothing, and does not the single fact of there being no reciprocity, no mutual obligation nullify the act? For what right can my slave have against me, if everything he has belongs to me? His right is my right, and it would be nonsense to speak of my having a right against myself. This is the very essence of Rousseau's theory. This is where we start to see fundamental unities and insights of an idea of class. And for that, our next step is Marx. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I have a major request. This couldn't be possible without our patrons on Patreon. If possible, consider pledging just a couple dollars a month. It helps out immensely. You can choose between tiers where you have the power to vote on next videos and where you can view exclusive videos only found on Patreon. Also consider bookmarking our Amazon link as I get a very small percentage of whatever you buy and it's completely free to you. Also something that helps too is subscribing to our Twitch with Twitch Prime. It's completely free to you. All you have to do is link your Twitch account with your Amazon Prime and I get a couple dollars from it and it's completely free on your end. Thank you guys so much. I thoroughly hope you enjoyed and hopefully I can see you in the next video.